Levy will guide you through critical thought conversations and a journey of directed disruption that makes a difference. Experience bold conversations with industry leaders who are willing to challenge the status quo. Hello and welcome to another episode. Today I am here speaking with Rod Collins. Rod is the leading expert on self-management, digital transformation, and I just had a technical glitch. And so bear with me, folks. Digital transformation. He's also an expert in the future of business. Rod is the host of the Thinking Differently podcast on the C-Suite Network, where he explores how techno technological innovations continue to transform the rules for how successful businesses work. Rod is a regular blog contributor on Substack and the author of Wiki Management, a revolutionary new model for a rapidly changing and collaborative world, which highlights the innovative tools and practices used by a new breed of business leaders to sustain extraordinary performance in a world reshaped by digital disruption. Rod is the former chief operating executive of Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal Employee Program, one of the nation's largest and most successful business alliances. Under his leadership, the business experienced its greatest five-year growth period in its near 60-year history. Rod, thank you so much for being here and giving me a little grace while I stumbled through and lost my, my script for a moment. <laughs> it shows we're all human, doesn't it? <laughs> we are all human and technology just sometimes makes our lives more difficult than it needs to be. Amen to that. All right. So let's get into this a little bit, Rod. You know, tell us a little bit about your background and how or why you, you chose healthcare as an industry. Well, I spent over uh, three decades with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal Employee Program. And I remember I was in, in my young 20s when I did that. And I wanted to work in a field that actually touched people's lives. Uh, I once told somebody I wouldn't want to work for a company that made paper uh, cups. I want to do something that's, that's you know, more personal. And uh, health insurance, I heard somebody describe once, uh, Peter Senge, who wrote The Learning uh, you know, about the learning uh, corporation once asked an insurance executive, well, how can you be an in insurance? You seem to be such a humane person. <laughs> okay. Cause a lot of people don't like people in insurance. And his answer I thought was profound. And that is when you're in health insurance or any insurance for that matter, your job is to be there when bad things happen to good people. And that's the way I looked upon my career in health insurance. I left that in about 2007, and since that time, I've been in the space of, uh, of management innovation. I think management needs to go through a tremendous uh, paradigm shift. We need to move away from centralized top-down hierarchies and move towards distributed peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, and I think as, as, as we talk, I think that, that transition needs to happen in more than just uh, shall we say, personnel organizations. I think it needs to be a shift in the fundamental way we organize the world in many dimensions. And and absolutely, and your theories, you actually put into practice in your role with Blue Cross Blue Shield, as you were, and we'll talk some more about what mm -hmm. those are, but this is actually, you have done this and you have seen the impact and the power of a different way of thinking and leading. Yes, yes. So why don't we kind of jump into that a little bit and, and talk about how that self-management idea works, what it is, how it works, and, and what it did for your teams um, and the experience with Blue Cross Blue Shield. In the, in the mid-90s, after uh, I'd spent about 15 years being the program's general auditor, which, by the way, is one of the best jobs in the world to have because you you comment on what everybody else does. But I was asked to lead the operations and we needed to turn it around. We had sustained about two decades of low growth, low performance. And the first thought that occurred to me was, you know, we're leading a network, not a hierarchy. But the only management lessons we learn, uh, whether it's commercial courses, whether it's an MBA programs, everything assumes a business is a top-down hierarchy. And I realized a lot of our performance issues had to do with, we spent a lot of time arguing about who's in charge. 
I thought, well, suppose we stop that argument and let's figure out how to lead a network. And in the process of doing that, uh, we, we came up with a number of innovative processes, protocols. We conducted meetings very, very differently. And uh, we were able to accomplish in two days what had eluded us for two decades. And that is to get unanimous consensus among 39 or, you know, 39, 40, 50 people uh, in a given session, which we had never been able to do because there were so many different local interests. And in the process of doing Wait, that- Wait, I want to stop just for one second, sure, Rod. Sure. Unanimous consensus in two days with yes. roughly 50 people yes. on topics that you had been kicking around for two decades. Right. And so it is, time and time again. And what it, what it is, is we discovered a way to tap into collective intelligence. And I believe human collective intelligence is the highest form of intelligence. And what we did in these meetings, we were able through some innovative facilitative techniques mm -hmm. to call out the strengths of various different people's thinking combine those through the process of the workshop itself, such that once that, um, once that solution was identified, and, and a solution usually involved about four different factors. And so I'd asked a group, if we do these four things, will we solve this problem, improve this process, okay, move beyond a log jam? And that, and, and, you know, in the 10 years that I did this within uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and then the, uh, um, 10 to 15 years since, I've yet to do one of these sessions where we don't have unanimous consensus. That's power collective intelligence. Because when you would look across the four items, what you generally would see is one item was important to one point of view, another item was important to another point of view. They appeared to be opposites, but when items three and four were thrown into the mix, it was the glue that made the whole set work. And that's what you can get to with collective intelligence. You never accomplish that with debate. I came to believe that there is no such thing as a healthy debate. It's an oxymoron. And there are different ways humans can process information far more creatively. And we, uh, we need that now. Now, one thing to point out is in a management situation, and this applies no matter what industry you're in, and I think it's particularly relevant to the medical world and the healthcare mm -hmm. world, there are, there, there's a, a, what I call the conscious competence matrix, and it's got four components. The first one is what I know, I know, and that's what qualified performers know. And the second is what I know, I don't know, and that's when we bring in outside experts and specialists, and most of management is in that space and they miss the other two boxes. The other two boxes are what I don't know that I know. And the, and the fourth box is, and this is the most dangerous, what I don't know that I don't know. And it turns out that those other two boxes can only be gotten to through collective intelligence. Because the way I find out um, what I don't know that I know is through wise crowds. Wise crowds pull that out. Every, when I would do these, everybody would say, no one of us could come up with the solution, but it was there among us. And that's what we called out. But the more important thing is you uncover the unknown unknowns. And that's what messes everything up. But I don't know that I don't know. Management's job is to move everything into the I know what I know box. And we miss a lot of it with traditional hierarchical management only works with linear thinking, which is the first two boxes. The second two boxes you add through systems thinking. And so what you have to do is get the whole system in the room. And this is really important in medicine because we're, you know, our human bodies are complex adaptive systems. We're not dealing with parts, we're dealing with whole systems. And so, uh, and I think, you know, there's a number of innovative hospitals who work that way. We work in teams, not just in isolated silos, so that they can react to each other. And as one professional considers doing one thing, another professional can go, no, that's not going to work, and here's why. And those are the types of conversations that we had in these two-day collective intelligence workshops. And that, that team approach, right, sharing ideas and perspectives um, in the medical field is uncomfortable 
right? Because each medical professional is accustomed to being the expert Mm -hmm. and the things I know that I know and very uncomfortable with the things that I don't know that I don't know. And watching that evolve and seeing that system come online and actually build teams for, for patient care, the, the leap forward that it makes for the patient experience is mind boggling. Yes, because we're treating the whole person and, and that's important. Yeah. Yeah, it is. With the work that you do, I know that digital transformation in healthcare is a, is a passion for you. Yes. The last couple of years have fast forwarded that digital transformation. We have accomplished in the last two years, things that haven't happened in nearly 40. Where are we headed with that? We have some momentum. What's next? I think we're in the midst of a game change in the healthcare industry. We are moving between the first wave of the digital revolution and the second wave. The first wave was driven by a single engine, the internet. And the industry least impacted by the first wave was the healthcare profession. While we may have gadgets and very sophisticated machines, none of them are connected. And what the first wave of the digital revolution was about is what happens when you connect things. Now it completely turned the media industry upside down. When was the last time you bought a CD? Uh, Where's Tower Records, okay? Uh, Musicians now, now give away music to sell concerts, whereas they used to do concerts to sell music. And so their world turned upside down because everything in their world was connected. And so in healthcare, um, it's going to be, I believe, to the second wave of the digital revolution, what media and entertainment was to the first wave, which is the most transformed industry. And here's why. The second wave is going to have two engines, not one. The Internet of Things and Artificial Intelligence. And these two things have been going to be tremendously powerful assets to the healthcare profession. Now, the Internet of Things, I think over the next decade, we will eventually see that everything and every person will be connected into a single global network. There will be sensors in everything. They're in our cars now, and uh, we get to experience that. They're going to be in our bodies. Um, initially, there'll be resistance to this, but eventually people will jump on board because the idea that you can see inside my body what's going on, I mean, that's the great challenge of healthcare is how do I see what's going on in the body? We won't have to wait for symptoms anymore. Sensors might be able to pick up, for example, when cancer is starting. And then with developments in such fields as biogenetics, okay, um, uh, we may be able to not only read what's happening in the body, but write what's happening in the body. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so um, now you combine that with artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence, most people have a misperception of it. They see it from the perspective of the Terminator. And they assume artificial intelligence will be a collection of individual agents, okay? And some even feel like Stephen Hawking, that these individual agents could eventually overtake humanity. I offer a different view of artificial intelligence. I think if we build artificial intelligence as collective intelligence systems, in other words, they're combining all the information, all the sensors, and with what artificial intelligence can do is recognize patterns and trends and weak signals that no human mind could ever see. Uh, And it's looking across vast data in rapid and quick times what we can begin to see is the development of a human machine symbiosis. So the doctor is not replaced by the artificial intelligence, but is enhanced by the artificial intelligence. What if in the process of treating a patient, okay, you have access to an intelligence system that's able to see inside that body, compare that body with every other human being who who is living or has ever lived Mm -hmm. uh, and give you the probabilities that for you to consider in the treatment. And it's, it's all presented to you instantaneously. You now have highly intelligent physicians interacting with a highly intelligent system. And it is combining these two that makes a difference. Now, And we're coming online with Web3. 
with blockchain and the ability to decentralize all of this data, but also protect it and make it readily available. So we're on a cusp. I And I think these two, I actually see it as second wave. And I think, um, I think if we build the internet of things and artificial intelligence systems on blockchain technology, then we have the capacity to create a highly evolved healthcare system. We also have the capacity to evolve highly, highly uh, create highly evolved societies. Now, the reason I say that blockchain, most people have a hard time with it because it is really truly a paradigm shift, but it's most distinguishing characteristic as evidenced in Bitcoin is no single entity can affect an action. It's, it's a collective agency system. And this is really important because if you think about it, if we have sensors in every human being, we've connected to them. We've also created the potential that one person can kill another person and we cannot allow that to happen. We can't allow single agents to hack into bodies. Lord knows what we're seeing with our computer systems. And so the protection against that uh, is to build a blockchain system. But it's going to be challenging because, you know, we're hearing banks, for example, getting into blockchain, but really they're not not as it's designed in Bitcoin. They're getting the immutable ledger aspects of it, but what they are not capturing is the consensus decision-making mechanism because they want to maintain control. And in a blockchain system, what a true blockchain system, no one gets to exercise control because control doesn't exist in a network. The only way things get done is through collaboration. You can't control a network, but what you can do is when you, the power is about connecting, not taking in charge. And the more connections, then the more power. And, the, and this is what we saw. Uh, the reason that we had the largest five-year growth period in the history of our business is we transformed our power from coercive power. We're in charge. We're going to tell you what to do. And now we argue about that. What we replaced it with was collaborative power. So when people come out of a session like this, with unanimous agreement, there's no arguments. And then they went back into the field. And what was interesting is this, this shared understanding translates to people who weren't in the room because you come up with very, very sensible solutions. What people would hear when they would hear what came out of these is, oh, that's really well thought out. Because when you combine the strengths from everywhere and have a higher level solution than any single person can come up with, what's there to argue with? And that's why that happened. Now, if we had that same discipline happening in healthcare or happening in the way we organize societies, we eliminate the need for control. We eliminate the need for coercion and, and collaboration is a higher experience of power. That's why I say we have the capability if we do this right to create a highly evolved society. On the flip side, if we don't shift to networks and remain in hierarchical structures, we're going to create the most totalitarian structures the world has ever seen and we're going to create more opportunities for single bad agents to do terrible things. In the healthcare industry now, I mean, we're coming out of one of the, a period of just horrific disruption and the worst kind, right? That unwanted disruption. It's fun when we get to create it, but when a yeah. pandemic happens and it cripples the globe for years, right? we have an industry that has given everything and now has to keep on keeping on. What do you see are some of the immediate challenges on the horizon and how do we get from addressing those immediate needs and moving to a place where we can start to leverage you know, collective wisdom and, and drive it forward? What's, what's the linchpin to get us there? I, I think it's a very pertinent question because we didn't manage COVID right. Number one, we shut out the frontline doctors. And that was horrific. And then we, we put a sense of fear into them that if they, if they did innovation, it could cost them their licenses. We went about this all wrong. It was a hierarchical approach. Mm -hmm. We had it being directed by bureaucrats who weren't seeing patients sitting somewhere in Bethesda, Maryland. And as a society, we focused on one and only one thing, and that is to eradicate a disease and everything else was dismissed. We didn't use a holistic approach to this problem. Um, I think, and it's, it's my own opinion, and I, 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 I 
stand by it. I think the Great Barrington Declaration had it right. There was a risk calculus to this. We should have brought in a collection of experts, not just public health experts, they were important, but frontline doctors. We should have brought in lawyers, small business people, large business people, educators. This affected every single aspect of our society. This wasn't just an, a, an infection pandemic, it was a social crisis and we didn't treat it as such. And we're paying the price for it now. And we don't know, we, none of us know how this is going to play out. We have no sense what the long-term impact of vaccination is. I hope it's fine. But in the short term, we learn, and, and it's interesting not acknowledge, we create a vaccine that doesn't work at the main job of a vaccine. And that is to stop the acquisition and the transmission. And if we had isolated the high-risk people, and we knew pretty early on what they were, if we had allowed the frontline doctors to experiment and to share knowledge with each other, I believe fewer lives would have been lost and better medicine would have been practiced. And I hope that the frontline doctors get their voices back. And, and I hope that as a society, we never silence those voices ever again. Um, but if we had used collective intelligence, I think we would have come up with a broader solution that would have that would have had less death and would have certainly been much less catastrophic from an economic standpoint. And we wouldn't be living with the consequences of these decisions for years to come. With your background, with your experience, what are some quick win, and then yeah, not even quick win, but what are some opportunities for healthcare workers today to move forward? What are some actions that you think that we should be taking that we may not be? I think a number of the hospitals have taken these already. You see much more of a team-based approach. And in networks, the, the, the unit's not the individual worker. So individual performance appraisals don't make sense in the network. The team is the unit of work. Also, leadership is not about the superhero, the individual. Leadership is a team sport and it is exercised in an interpersonal and group way. And leadership should shift among the team depending upon the skills needed for the particular aspect of the problem that we're dealing with now. If we had done that with COVID, we would have started out with the public health experts. Eventually, you would have been looking at business people, school educators, frontline doctors would have been coming up with ideas. We'd be passing that around continually, continually learning. And teams are very good at continual learning. Yeah. And we would have been focused on the societal needs and not, we had a very myopic view and a very myopic approach of you know, addressing a virus. Right. And the impact of that virus was so much broader and deeper. I totally get that. Yeah. Rod, one of my favorite questions that I ask every guest is if I were to give you a magic wand, and this magic wand is very powerful and it removes the constraints of time, cost, people, resources, right? If there was this one thing you could wave the wand and solve mm -hmm. for the healthcare industry, what would you do with it? The biggest thing I think needs to happen in the healthcare industry is to shift its fundamental focus. Its fundamental operating model is about sickness and treatment. Mm -hmm. That's how it gets paid. All right. The fundamental model of a healthcare system should be health and prevention. The reason the United States had one of the worst experiences with COVID is we are among the most unhealthy societies on the planet. We are not building health and prevention into our fundamental societal day-to-day -day structures. And anything we can do to move things in that direction, I think would make a big difference. And I think we need to come up with new operating, new business models where revenues are generated from those activities, not just from from treating people who are sick. If we could see that type of change, that would be healthcare in a more highly evolved human society. And I think part of that, and in, in, whether you were kind or not, right, that holistic approach is we in America in particular solve everything with a pill, a shot, a, a something, 
rather than behaviorally making choices to be healthy and care for ourselves. And if we flip it all upside down and start with wellness, yeah. it, it changes the model substantially. Yeah. It's things that need to start in school. Okay. We, we need to be, we need to be teaching our children what a healthy life is about. And we need to be teaching them about nutrition and the importance of exercise and, and life choices and, and, and better prepare them for society. Uh, so that's, um, you know, and I think there are probably many innovations that we can't even think of right now that once we aim ourselves in that direction, tap into our collective intelligence, that would truly make a big difference in terms of public health. Absolutely brilliant in the simplicity and huge and the magic wand would absolutely be required to make that paradigm shift occur. Rod, thank you so much. That concludes our show. Rod Collins was our guest today. I thank you for listening and watching. Make sure you catch us again next time on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Google, Pod, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, anywhere else that you're, you're getting your um, podcast, video cast content. Look forward to seeing you next time. You have just experienced Break Everything with Lisa L. Levy. Critical conversations on direct and disruption that makes a difference.